This review video focuses on nouns only. We will go through declensions, usage, and cases. First of all, what is a noun? You can define a noun easily by saying person, place, thing, or idea. This is the traditional definition that you've been taught probably since elementary school. Think of examples like a man, um, a lake, a rock, a memory. You can also think of nouns as words that can be preceded logically by the words a, an, or the. We call these articles in English. So if I can say a man, the man, that's a noun. We never use a, an, and the in front of anything that's not a noun. So that's a quick way to test if you're not sure. Latin, take note, does not have articles. There is no a, an, and the in Latin, so we're going to use the form of a word itself to figure out whether it's a noun, or we can always use the definition. Nouns have several properties. We're going to talk about three. Gender. Gender is masculine, feminine, or neuter. When we talk about gender, it's a little bit weird for us because in English, nouns don't have gender. There are many other languages that do have gender. Russian, French, Spanish all have gender. And uh, many of them get that from Latin, but not all of them. Russian is not Latin derived. So this is a notion that has extended across many different language groups. But we don't see it a lot in English. The one place we do is in our pronouns. So we are specific with the words he, she, and it. That's what we mean by gender. In English, when we use gender, it is strictly linked to sex. We're thinking about as something male or female. We're talking about animals or people. Whereas in Latin, we're talking about all nouns. All nouns have a gender. And just because something isn't an animal or a person and it doesn't have a sex, that doesn't mean that it's neuter. So for example, a pencil is masculine where a piece of paper is feminine. There's not always a lot of logic to that. Um, sometimes you can predict it. A man is going to be masculine. A woman is going to be feminine. A rock is going to be neuter. But not all of our genders make sense. Sometimes they're even laughably opposite to what we would expect. For example, manliness is a feminine word. We can predict it sometimes. We'll talk about some rules throughout the year that we can use to remember. Sometimes they're tied to declension. But just keep in mind that gender is something you need to learn when you learn the word itself. So when I learn the word man, I learn we're weary masculine man. It's part of the definition. Gender itself is not necessarily going to have a lot of import for a sentence. It's not going to change the meaning. What we will use gender for is adjectives. So when we talk about a man and we want to describe him as tall, the word tall will also need to be masculine to agree with the man. This is totally unnecessary in English because adjectives in English are right in front of the noun they modify. They have to be right there. But nouns in Latin can be very different and very uh, far away from the adjectives that modify them. So this is one place that gender will help us. Number refers to singular or plural. If you've already watched the verb review video or you remember verbs, you know that they also have number. And when we talk about uh, subject-verb agreement, this is often what we mean, is that if I'm talking about one person, then my verb must also be singular. If I'm talking about two people, then my verb must be plural. This is very easy to see in English. We're talking about whether we put an S on a word most of the time. We all learned our irregular plurals like oxen and geese and mice in Latin there aren't really irregular plurals, but we do have several different declension patterns, which we'll talk about in a minute. Case. This is the biggest difference between Latin and English. Because English is not an inflected language, we don't need cases. We have the same usages as these cases, but we don't change the form of the word itself to depend on how it's used in the sentence. In Latin, we're going to change the ending, in other words, change the case of a noun, if we want to use it in a different way in the sentence. We'll talk about what each case does, but first just the names. They're all kind of long and hard. Nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, ablative, vocative, and locative. The vocative is not super common and it's very easy, so we tend to leave it out frequently. 
It also almost always matches the nominative, which is another reason we can leave it out. The locative often matches the ablative or the genitive, and we will talk about the locative more in Latin too, but it is only to show location, so it's very rare as well, and it's only used for certain words, so that's why you don't know that one. But you will. Let's talk about uses. The nominative is extremely important. It is the subject of the sentence. So whoever I am talking about, or whatever I am talking about in the sentence. You can think of this as the person or thing who does the action, unless the sentence is passive. Or you can just think of it as whatever I'm discussing in the, in the sentence, the main idea, the main subject. We would use it that way still. Nominatives can also be predicate nominatives. I didn't include that in the examples. That would be if I say, I am a woman, woman would be a predicate nominative, where I'm restating the subject. But here are examples of subjects. I have two dogs. The man is a stranger. Rocks and sticks were thrown by the children. In the third sentence, rocks and sticks are plural. That's our only plural one here. It's also a compound subject, which means that rocks are a subject and sticks are a subject, and each of them are plural words. But I can stick an and in the middle, or in Latin an et or a que, and I can have what's called a compound subject where I'm referring to multiple different things, but as long as I'm using them as the subject of the same verb here, where they're both were thrown, then that's just a, a compound subject. It's not a complex sentence. The genitive case shows possession primarily, as in Tuesday's assignment or the door of the house. The partitive genitive is when we're talking about pieces of things, partitive as in a part of something. So uh, I would like a piece of cheese. The genitive would be the, the whole, the whole wheel of cheese. And then the piece is going to come out of it. And that will be whatever case it needs to be for, for the sentence. So in this case, it would be a direct object there because I would like it. Um, but the partitive is what we have a piece of. It's the whole. The dative case is the indirect object and occasionally can show possession. So an indirect object is a little tricky for a lot of people because we can get direct object, but indirect gets a little complicated. Will you give me a hand? What you're giving is a hand. That's the direct object. But you're giving it to me. I'm the indirect object. So I'm being affected by the subject and by the action, but I am not directly receiving it. I am not a gift in this situation. I am not being given, but I am receiving something. So think of an indirect object as receiving a benefit or a harm from the situation. As in, we are donating clothes to the needy. Now, there are some cases where we'll use the data for possession, as in, my name is, so in Latin, mihi nominas. We also use it with certain verbs that we'll encounter along the way. Um, but this is generally the kind of possession where uh, multiple people might possess the same thing. As in, I'm not the only person in the world named Emily. It's a name for me. It's a word for me. It's my name, but I don't own the name. So it's a little bit different from the kind of possession that a genitive would show, where it would be like my socks. I own the socks, but I don't really own the name because other people can also have it. So it's the difference in property and um, having something that belongs to you but is not property, like a name. The accusative case. Another very important one. We'll see the nominative and accusative the most probably this year. The direct object, and it can also be placed to which. Direct objects are pretty easy. It's whatever is receiving the action of the verb. So the soldiers attacked the enemy. The enemy are being attacked. They're the ones getting the action. We are donating clothes to the needy. That's the same sentence as last time. But here the clothes are the direct object, where the needy were the indirect object. Notice that the direct object becomes the subject of a passive sentence. So if I invert these and make them passive, then they become the subject, which would mean in Latin that they need to be nominative. So as long as you are using an active verb, you can have direct objects, but if you're using a passive verb, you cannot. There is no way. 
So there won't be a direct object in a sentence with a passive verb. Um, in the last sentence, this spring we are traveling to Italy, which is true, by the way. Uh, Italy is a place to which would also be accused of. It follows certain prepositions. In this sentence, the Latin would be ad Italian. So the word ad would trigger that accusative usage. The ablative is our last big case, the ones that are in the declension charts. It has many, many usages, and this is not all of them, but these are the ones that we cover in Latin 1. Place where, as in in the fields. Where are we doing it? In the fields. Easy enough. Place where will generally have a preposition in front of it, unless it's really obviously a location, in which case I don't have to have one. Um, accompaniment with my girlfriend. Anytime I do something with another person, that is accompaniment. Notice that this is strictly for people or possibly animals. I could do something with my dog, but it's not for using tools. The hunter was bitten by the wolf. That's an ablative of agent, as in a person doing something in a passive sentence. So remember, the hunter in this sentence is the subject, but he's not the one doing the biting. If in the passive sentence I want to indicate who is doing the action, I will use an ablative of agent. In Latin, we see that as a or ob, followed by a passive and a ablative who is a person or animal. So sometimes we call it personal agent. It's a good way to remember it has to be a person. Um, with anger is an ablative of manner. It's how the wolf was biting, but we don't mean with his teeth, not what tool is he using. We mean how as in what way, what, uh, what emotional import perhaps, or I might say with speed. It's the manner in which he bites. We sailed from Greece is a place from which, that one's pretty easy. But in a longboat, here is our ablative of means. That is a tool. So if I say with a hammer or by means of a sword, any kind of physical object that is a tool is going to be an ablative of means. So in a longboat is how we sailed. It is a means. Whereas with anger is a manner. Those get confused a little bit sometimes. So consider whether the object is a tool like biting with teeth, or is it a way of doing something, as in biting with anger? The vocative. This one's pretty easy. It only has one job, which is direct address. And this is when I call someone by name, as in George. Now I can also call them by a title, like hey buddy, or ma'am, sir. Any of those would be direct address. And uh, in Latin, they're the vocative. The vocative tends to look like the nominative, with the exception of words that end in U.S. If the word ends in U.S., it changes to E, as in Marcus, becomes Marque. If it ends in I-U-S, it changes to I, as in Julius, becomes Julie. But other words will just look like the nominative. These are very easy to spot because they're always names or titles. And they're often at the beginning of a sentence because you're using them to get someone's attention. The locative is one we'll cover briefly this year. It's very, very specific. Only some words appear in the locative. Those are names of cities, names of islands, small islands specifically, as in islands that would only have one city on them, so cities. And in uh, several specific words, including in the country, Rus, uh, on the ground, Umi, and a couple of others that you won't learn this year, but only very certain situations do we see the locative, which is why we don't teach it until later. So in Rome is one place that we would use the locative. We don't have to use the word in in Latin. We would just use Rome in the locative, which is uh, Romae. So Romae, age sicut Romani. So very simple, much shorter than the English. So it's always going to be a one word. We don't use prepositions with the locative. So if there's a preposition, it's going to be accusative or ablative. On the ground is another example. That would just be the word umi in Latin. So in English, notice these are prepositional phrases. In Latin, they will no longer be if we use the locative. Now, 
a quick run through of your declensions. These are just patterns for nouns. We're talking about endings that tell us the case and the number of a word we're looking at. That's the whole point of having the ending there. In English, we get these things from endings sometimes, as in we add s to make something plural, but we don't use inflection to show case. We use the order of the words in the sentence. So that is the primary difference between English and Latin. We have five main declensions. The first three are more common than the last two, so there are not very many fourth and fifth declension nouns, so we save that for Latin too. Don't worry, you're not supposed to know it yet. Uh, the third declension is the most common. There are more third declension nouns than there are any other declension. So that's the one that you want to know the best if you have to prioritize one. The second, third, and fourth also have a neuter variation. So if I have a neuter word, it will have a couple of different endings, and I'll show you those in a second. The first and fifth declensions uh, do not have any neuter. The first is all feminine, the fifth declension is mostly feminine with a few masculines, but they do not have any neuters. There's no first neuter and no fifth neuter. So a quick review of the first declension, I use the word sportula, which is a gift basket. Our endings are in red here. I have included the macrons or the long marks which you do not have to know for my classes, one or two, but if you choose to go on to three, four, and AP, you may find it useful to know your macrons because it helps you read things um, in meter. So if you, if you go on to read poetry ever, it's handy to know these, but you're not required to know them right now. I have songs for most of these. I'm going to sing them, but feel free to skip over if you don't want to listen to me sing. So this one goes to the tune of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. A A E A E A M A A E A R U M I S A S I S two. Now our first declensions through. Notice that most of these have an A in them, so we think of A as the uh, favorite letter of the first declension. It's a good way to spot it and to remember your endings. Notice that there are several repeats in this one as well. The AE in particular can be problematic, so you want to look at those a little extra carefully. Remember when you're deciding what declension a word is, when you first learn it, you should look at the genitive. So the, the second word there, the genitive singular, is going to tell you that this is first declension. So if you learn a new word like sportula, in the dictionary it would say sportula, comma, sportuli, and that AE right there tells you this is first declension. Then you don't have to think very hard because it's probably feminine, it is, and uh, you know how the rest of the declension goes. So they don't have to list all of these forms for you in a dictionary, they just give you the first two, which is also what you will get from me on a vocabulary list. The second declension is primarily masculine. There are a couple of exceptions, but not very many. This word is the word for clover, kittasis. Uh, the second declension really loves the letters U, O, and I, so look for those differences. And I use um, the tune, I use a couple different tunes, but I'll use the Jingle Bells tune for this one. U, S, I, O, um, O, I, O, R, U, N, I, S, O, S, I, S, that's the second declension. That one is pretty catchy. I think that's that's a better song than I used to use, and I encourage you to remember that one because it really is a good, quick way to remember it. So if you're looking at a new word like kittasis, you would know it was second declension when you saw the I in the genitive singular. The U.S. is a good clue, but there are some third declension words that begin with U.S., so don't rely on that by itself. you got to look at the genitive. The second declension, neuter is almost exactly the same as the primary second declension, but it has three changes. The nominative singular ends in UM, and that one is going to be the easy one to remember. You don't really even have to think of it as a different ending because you always get the nominative when you learn a new word. So you'll just learn that word. And then you have to remember that if the nominative singular ends in UM and it's neuter, 
then the nominative plural is actually a. You can also think of this as the neuter rule, and it works for all three neuters, neuter patterns, is that the nominative and accusative match, so um and um and ah and ah, and the nominative and accusative plural always end in a, so tele na, tele na, for both of these here. That word means perfume, by the way. Uh, the song for this one, um, I skipped it. Uh, you can use a couple. Let's try uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, I think is my favorite for this one. U-M-I-O-U-N-M-O-A-O-R-U-M-I-S-A-I-S. That's the new news I've been mentioned. Sorry for my bad singing, but if you listen to these a couple times and get them in your head, it's a really good way to remember them all the way through. Remember that ideally you know all of your declensions at sight, as in you don't have to think about them too hard, you don't have to sing through them, but you might still be going from the beginning to remember what you're, what, what, eh, to remember what you're looking at for these. The third declension, remember I said this is the most common, so this is one to know very, very well. The nominative is whatever it wants to be. So you'll learn the nominative on a case-by-case -case basis. It does not have a specific ending. Calx is the word for heel. Notice that its stem changes. So calx, calcus, that C appears. And this is why it's especially important in the third declension to look at the genitive singular before you're trying to make any other form of the word. We'll use that stem. And then the IS tells you that it's a third declension noun. Um, we don't even sing the first one here because it doesn't have a standard ending, and I use happy birthday. I-S-I-E-M-E-E-S-U-N-I-E-U-S-E-S-I-D-E-U-S. The trick with this one is to remember that the stem may change and that the nominative is not going to match. A uh, third declension likes ease. If you're more of a pattern person, you're going to see a lot of ease in the third declension. Now, there's also something called the I stem, which is a slight, slight difference. This is a very small variation from the regular third declension. We only see it in the third. It's not something that pops up in any other declension. Um, and all it means, and you might have spotted it already, is that the genitive plural gets an extra I. So instead of natum right there, it's natium. That is a really super minor thing. It just is good to know, if you should run into that, that it is still the word natus, even though it has an I there. So that's the only reason to know about I stems, is so that you're not tricked into thinking it's something else. Natus is the word for but, or buttocks typically used in the plural, but uh, you could use it in the singular, I guess. Um, and I don't have a special song for this because all we've done is added an I. The third declension has a neuter variation and it follows the neuter rule, so the nominative and accusative must match. That means that the accusative is whatever the nominative was. So this word corpus corporis is neuter, and so when I want to use corpus in the accusative, I just use whatever the nominative was, which in this case is corpus. I don't have to remember any ending at all, I just repeat the nominative. Which means if calx had been neuter, then calx would also be the accusative. It's not, but any neuter word, that's going to be true. Um, the plural still follows that neuter rule, where the nominative and accusative plural end in A. So that's consistent. The neuter rule works for all three. And I don't have a song for this one. Oh, there is a typo right here, though. Oops, oops. The date of singular should be I right there. It should be corpore. So if you're using this um, to study, make sure that you note corpore in that date of singular. The neuter also has an I stem variation. The only difference is still just extra I's. The ablative singular is an important one, though, because it actually changes the E ending from the regular third to an I, so the E is not even there anymore. The others are just extra I's in the nominative, genitive, and accusative plural. The fourth declension is new to you this year in Latin 2, assuming that's who's watching the video. 
be anybody, I guess. Um, but it is new in Latin too for us. This one, I don't have a song, but uh, one of my students last, or a couple years ago, brought a very good little memory trick to my attention. And it's very offensive. Um, but pretend that you are talking to somebody that you just have had enough of, you're really tired of them, and you're so angry, and you say, you stupid, you idiot, you moron, you, you stupid, you utter moron, I bet you stupid, you stupid, I bet you stupid. And it spells out the endings. That sounds like it would be hard to remember, but I've actually found that since I heard that trick, that is what I think of when I do the fourth declension. So if you practice it a few times, I bet it will work for you too. The fourth declension loves you. So you will see lots of you's here. Every ending has a you. Uh, there is a typo here. Mini bus should be my bus, but that's not an ending error. Um, again, with the macrons, you only need to know this for poetry, so you don't need to worry about them too much. The fourth has a neuter variation, which means very little except the neuter rule applies, so u and u, and then ua and ua in the plural. And then we see uh, several endings just sort of drop their consonants. So ui just is u, and uh, the um becomes u and then the genitive plural gets an extra use. So we've got lots of use, even more than we had before. And then last but not least, the fifth declension, which is extremely rare. You will only learn uh, probably three or four fifth declension words this year, but unfortunately they're very common words. The words dies, which means day. I didn't change the picture, sorry about that. Uh, race, which means thing, and fides, which means trust or credibility, are all fifth declension words. The fifth declension loves e. We have an e in every single ending. Notice that a lot of these have consistent patterns. So like the i in the dative singular comes back several times. The s in the nominative and accusative plural comes back. The bus in the dative and ablative comes back. So you can use patterns to your advantage, especially if you're not into songs. If you are into songs, I hate to say it, but I don't have a fifth declension song. If you can find one, share it with me. It would be a great contribution to our class. That is it for nouns. If you need more review, remember you can go to latintutorial.com or you can go to the practice portion on my website where I have practice for each declension separately and also for cases. Thanks for watching.